Hey there! So welcome to another one of my Friends of Constructed Adventures interviews. Um, today I'm actually going to be talking to Ilan Lee, uh, who I call the godfather of the alternate reality game. He might correct me, um, but he kind of is. He was the lead designer behind some of the most popular alternate reality games of all time, including The Beast, I Love Bees, and Year Zero. For those that are unfamiliar, Alternate Reality Game is uh, a game that's kind of set in a digital world and a real world, which blurs the lines of what's real and what's been created. Um, oftentimes, it's, it's used to promote something. In this case, The Beast was for AI. I Love Bees was Halo 2. Year Zero was a project with Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. Uh, he then very famously went on to co-create Exploding Kittens, which is by far the most backed Kickstarter of all time. Uh, and one of the most popular board games of all time. So we're going to talk about alternate reality games, game design, his life change over to building exploding kittens, and then we're going to spend the end playing his new game, Poetry for Neanderthals. So I'm going to bring in Elon so he can correct anything I said, but Elon, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, it's uh, so the first thing I'd love to chat about is how were you as a kid? Like, what what did you do to get you to this life of creating games and things like that? What was little Elon yeah, like? So many mistakes. <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm the oldest of four kids, and so as the oldest, my job was always really to entertain my siblings, and that meant going out into the backyard, picking up rocks and sticks and insects, and making games out of them. Um, it was like truly my job to to help everyone figure out what the hell are we going to do on this boring summer afternoon. And uh, I just kind of became addicted. Yeah. So do you, you are a father now. I just met your mm. daughter. Um, yeah. Do you just have one child? One child, two years. Uh, and yeah. so I would imagine with this pandemic, how has the shift been trying to work and also uh, entertain a child? So tricky. Um, she, right, I'm, it, count on it she's going to walk in at some oh, yeah. point and totally interrupt this. yeah <laughs> yeah that's how this works um yeah it's been it's been really interesting both my wife and i work full time and so we, because there's no such thing as daycare or schools or, or nannies or any of that anymore uh we just have to do it in shifts and so i have to be really careful about scheduling meetings but always leaving enough time for brainstorming after the meetings because that's where i get the actual work done uh, and I can only do that for two hours at a time. And then I got to run outside and take care of the kid while she jumps on a bunch of phone calls. So oh, it's been challenging, and, really challenging. And it's tough with a two-year-old, like a little bit older, you could potentially be like, hey, I have something to keep you busy. But with a two-year-old, yeah. you're always got to keep hands on. That was my, yeah. my big shift with my business from doing events to trying to create how-tos and tutorials for parents to keep their kids busy, where it's like, here's yeah. a puzzle. It'll take yeah. you like... 50 seconds to put together and you should get 30 minutes out of it. So like you get That's a great. net gain of yeah. 29 minutes. Yeah. 50 seconds. We're constantly doing this, this horrible thing like, okay, should we be horrible parents today and just put her in front of the TV? Cause we need those 20 <laughs> minutes right now. But, uh, I'm happy to say most of the time the answer is no, yeah. uh, but sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes you have to hit the eject button every once in a while when you're like yeah. on the precipice of like some big thing or something's oh, yeah. happening. So oh, yeah. it makes me uh, even more thankful that you could take the time out of your busy schedule of running a company <laughs> and being a full-time father, um, and juggling time with kids. My pleasure. Yeah. So it, it also goes without saying anybody that is watching, if you do have any questions, feel free to add them into the comment section and we'll bring them up as we talk. I have some questions from Instagram and Reddit, both from the alternate reality gaming community and from the exploding kittens community cool. um, who are very active in rabbit communities online and on Reddit. Um, but I, I guess the, the big thing is tell me about how, how you got into working because you, you kind of got into working for uh, alternate reality games through working for Microsoft. Is that correct? Yeah. So correct. can you yeah. walk me through your life path basically getting <laughs> from like high school, college into this world? Because yeah. most of the people I talk to are like, we just kind of started doing it because there's no... Yeah. Like, there's no school, I mean, they're starting to get there for game design, but it's not like business or journalism. Of course. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I have always been a pretty terrible student. And uh, what that meant for me in particular was I've always loved uh, physics. And um, I, I couldn't, it took me a while to figure out why I loved physics. I promise this will all make sense in a second. <laughs> um, I, I really got enamored with the concept that you could work on a problem, 
in the, in a textbook, in a physics book. Um, and they were really, really hard and I, and, and very, very hard to solve. The problem with physics that I found was that if you did get stumped, you could always go to the back of the book and there was the answer. And that always felt like a bit of a letdown to me. Um, because why am I working so hard to solve this when somebody else already has and written down the answer? So I went into college uh, studying physics and kind of came to that realization about like, I'm unsatisfied because I'm not good enough at physics yet to work on the things that nobody has solved and everything I am working on is already solved and why, why am I bothering? Yeah. And then computer science entered the equation. And that was so cool, right? Because there is, there are no answers in the backs of those books, right? Everything is being newly invented. There's a million different known solutions and, and triple that uh, for the unknown solutions. And uh, I really fell in love with that. So uh, when I got to college, I transitioned to computer science, uh, did a lot of years in computer science. It took me six years to graduate college because again, terrible student, hard time paying attention to really anything. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Um, and then from there, uh, I realized that uh, computer science is even more fun when you can put pretty pictures on the screen and apply <laughs> all the programming to those pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. So uh, I switched over to computer graphics. I did an internship at Industrial Light and Magic and got to work on you know giant movies and creating monsters. And it was, it was the greatest thing ever. Absolutely fell in love with it. And then... Um, to cut a, a much, much longer story shorter, uh, one day Microsoft called me up and said, we are starting this new division called the Direct Xbox, uh, named after their, their software platform, DirectX. And uh, would I come over and help them out with that because I seem to be good at creating things and they have an interest in that. Yeah. And that was it. So much of that was just luck, being at the right place at the right time, finding the interesting things interesting and uh trying my best to get good at it it's it's wild um i don't know if you listen to a lot of podcasts but how i built this guy raz uh, in his yep. his podcast which i was lucky to be featured like at the end in that little snippet i know, I know. that's how i met you by yeah. the way that's oh. how i first found out about you oh, listening man. to that podcast i need to yeah. try to get on there again it's been <laughs> I, I managed to get on a second time and that was good that was so big for my business because i am awesome very you know i'm like a guy just building adventures yep. but Yep. His yeah, his question is always you know how much of it's skill and how much of it's luck, and it always kind of drives me crazy because I'm in that camp that's like, there's so much luck. Oh man, there's so much variance involved in RNG and life, and you have to be good. But for every you know for every actor or singer that makes it, there's hundreds if not thousands that are just as talented and just yep. as that, and they just didn't they weren't singing at a coffee shop when Usher walked in, right? Uh, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Oh. Yep. So I want to jump ahead um, okay. to the alternate reality game because I I had a lot of very broad questions. And the one thing that I see <laughs> is like, how do you make an alternate reality game? Which is like, oh, yeah, this is what you do, right? Yeah, Where it's, yeah. it's a little bit Just, more yeah, complex. Step A and then step B and then you're done. Yeah. yeah. So when it came to The Beast, um, which was basically the first one that was ever made, right? Was there anything before that? Am I wrong? I, I like to point at uh, The Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Ooh. as the very first one, actually. Okay. Uh, but we could talk for hours yes. about whether or not that statement is correct, <laughs> and it would be so many fun hours doing so. I'll come back and I'll do I'll do a little thing on it later about all yeah, of these. Yeah. Um, but the Beast is is kind of dubbed as one of the first ones, or at least one of the first big ones. Um, and it was for AI, artificial intelligence, basically set to promote it. Um, I did a lot. I watched a lot of videos and did a lot of research on the Beast. And it turns out a lot of people didn't realize it was happening until after the movie had come out. Is that accurate? That's pretty accurate, yeah. yeah. And so it started with um, clues that were dropped in posters or in like the trailers? Yeah, so we decided, uh, we launched the thing as a promotional vehicle for Steven Spielberg's movie AI. Yeah. And there's a, another long story about how we got involved in that and why we built the thing, um, why we thought it would work as marketing. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we launched it, right? We put up a series of hundreds of websites and phone numbers, and we hired actors, and everything was ready to go. But we were performing to crickets. Like, just yeah. nobody knew the thing existed, right? You have to market your marketing. And um, what, what I did, uh, my, my mentor is a guy named Jordan Weissman, who was my boss at Microsoft. By far, smartest guy I know, uh, 
who was really the the the, the guiding light behind the early days of these these things. Um, he said, "We've we got to." We need to get this out there somehow. Who do we talk to? What do we do? And at the time, one of the most popular movie sites was Ain't It Cool News, mm -hmm. uh, run by oh, Harry yeah. Knowles. And uh, so what we decided to do was we took the one sheet for the movie, the giant movie poster, right? And at the bottom, it's the picture of David, the lead character. And at the bottom is the billing block, directed by Spiel Steven Spielberg, produced by Kathleen Kennedy, etc. And we just took a Sharpie and circled letters on there that spelled out <laughs> the URL of one of the rabbit holes, like mm -hmm. one of the, the starting Entry websites points. to get into this thing. Yeah, there just happened to be the right letters on there. And yeah. so, so you just got lucky. Got right? another luck. Got, lucky. <laughs> got lucky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we rolled it up and we put it in a poster tube and mailed it to him without any note, without any explanation at all. Just here's this weird poster with circled letters. Are you smart enough to figure out this super hard puzzle? Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he did. And he posted about it. And overnight, our numbers went from the like 20 people to our 20 friends playing it yeah. to close to like 2 million people playing it. Wow. And um, that's not all 100% because of Harry Knowles. That's because he had a massive audience, hundreds of thousands of people that jumped into these things, to, into this thing, who had then never seen anything like it and told all their friends. Yeah. And it just exploded at that point. I think there's going to be some correlation between this and Exploding Kittens with yeah, Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turns out yeah. word of mouth is really uh, popular. Yeah. No kidding. That's so it's it's wild because I always see in the alternate reality game subreddit, there's about fifty thousand people. And it's it's somewhat active, but you always see people that are like, I found this napkin with some writing on it. Is this an alternate reality <laughs> game? And everyone's like, No, like this is a crazy person. Yeah, and that's the that's the trickiest part about this is like you the alternate reality game's supposed to be this secret because you you need it to seem like not everybody knows about it, but you also right. kind of need everyone to know about it, right. which is why when we sat down for lunch, you talked about the trickiness and why, and I want, to, I want to talk about that a little bit later, about why you kind of moved on is because you basically just became a glorified marketing platform. Yeah, um, that's, that's exactly right. And so one um, of the questions is how much, how much money do you need to do a successful alternate reality game realistically? We did a bunch of them. Um, starting 42 Entertainment, uh, and running that all, all the way through. I, I think I ran that company or worked at that company for six ish years, seven years. And in that time, we probably made a dozen of them. Mm -hmm. um, and they really, there was such a, a large range of budgets there. I think on the lower end, we spent somewhere around fifty thousand yeah. dollars for some of the smaller ones, mm -hmm. um, and then on the upper ones, two two million plus. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just depends. Like the way I always look at it is, um, you have, there's two sides of the scale. Yeah. There's the amount of money you can spend or the amount of time you have to burn before a bunch of people, uh, find this thing. Yeah. And you can tip the scale in either direction. If you want a bunch of people on day one, you have to spend against that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that money and you can afford months and months and months of a slow build, that's another way in. Mm -hmm. That's, so how, what's the process? The process is you build a bunch of rabbit holes um, for people to go in. Do you, like, with mine, I always start with the ending. How is this thing going to end? But most of the time, people hire me where they're like, I want to propose to my significant other. I want to do right. a surprise party. So I'm like, cool, right. this is going to end with a proposal. Right. Like, me yeah. hits the ground at this time. And it's easy to kind of lock that down and then lock down the beginning. And then, you know, oh, they have to go here and here and here and here. So how does it work with an alternate reality game? Like, what's the mm -hmm. ending? Like, how does somebody win this game? Yeah, the ending um, is the part you should always design first, and not even once have I ever designed first. Um, it's just, it's, it's, I don't know why, we just never get around to it. We're, like The thing that I am most fascinated by with alternate reality games is the same thing I'm most fascinated by with card games today, which is, what is the core gameplay loop? Yeah. What is the thing that you can do every day that is not going to get old, that is going to keep re-challenging you and make you excited to return to this thing. Yeah. And if that's, you know, in the case of I Love Bees, we, one of, the, one of the bigger ones we did, I identified very quickly the thing I'm fascinated with, the thing I'm going to want to do is let me decipher a, uh, a puzzle that's going to get me a GPS coordinate and when I get there, there's going to be a randomly ringing payphone and I'm going to answer it and unlock story. That's so like cool. That. Right, that loop Works. I could get excited about over and over and over again. So, so we started that project with that loop, and we built the beginning onto that, and then we built the ending after that. 
um, which is the, the wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely the wrong <laughs> way to do it. Uh, but I, it's the thing I'm most passionate about, so it's where we always start. Yeah, and I would imagine it's a lot easier to do with a card game where everything's kind of contained in this. For sure. And I've, I've tried to use payphones, and you can't do it anymore because after 9-11, there's oh. payphones aren't a thing anymore, and everyone's oh. got cell phones, so you lose these right. kind of cool intrinsic pieces, which is unfortunate. I know, it. I know. I still, to this day, like I was so trained to search for payphones. We, we, had to, we built a database of several hundred thousand payphones for that project, wow. and I got so trained to look for those things that today – was it 20 years later? <laughs> Anytime I'm driving down the street and there's a payphone, I focus on like a B1. <laughs> like I, I laser focus on that thing because it is still part of my brain. Oh my God, do I need to write that down? Like yeah. that's important. I can't believe I found one. You know? Yeah, like, oh, it's like a, it's like your own little treasure hunt, right? Where you're just yeah. trying to find payphones. Yeah. I was doing one for a woman in um, San Francisco, and that's I wanted so badly to have her go buy a payphone. I found a payphone that literally dialed out. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just have to find the phone number. And of course, the phone number's in there. And I went online and I searched and searched and searched and searched. <laughs> and just like, you can't dial in. And so it's such a pain. But that is important too. Just, I always like to assume that people that are watching have no idea about any of the analogies. So when you talk about a gameplay loop, um, most games, both video games, board games, always have the same gameplay loop. Um, Settlers of Catan is a good example, right? Where the gameplay loop is to roll the dice and you collect the cards and then you make a decision based on the strategy to try to collect more cards. Video games yeah. have the same thing, you know, like yeah. you go into a battle, you go into a dungeon, you beat the boss, you go out and you get a new item and now you can open up new parts of the world. Uh, yeah, and, and, that, and that goes down to every, every game you've ever enjoyed. As simple as a game like Uno, right? Mm -hmm. It's draw a card, uh, well, you don't start by drawing. It's look at the card on the table. Can you make a match? If not, draw a card, yeah. right? And like that loop, that, that super simple loop is what needs to be able to drive you from the beginning to the end of the game. And if it fails to hold your attention, the game will fail fundamentally. Yeah. I, I've heard of video games where they'll take, you know, Batman, Arkham Asylum was a good example where they literally started and they said, we're going to put Batman with enemies in a blank room and we're going to do the combat. And that is the most important thing and we yep. don't do anything else until that's fun. That com because combat's such a big part. Because it's Batman yep. beating up bad guys. If yep. that's not fun, then nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how good the story is. Doesn't matter how good yep. anything else is too. It yep. has like I love bees could be amazing, but the payphone thing is such a cool idea that that has to be there. Yeah, yeah it yeah. has to be there. And and like looking at something like Batman, right? Once they nail that, once they've got their core gameplay loop, everything else kind of falls out of that yeah. because now it's like okay. We know how to fight a bad guy. How do you find a bad guy? Well, let's work on that a while, for a while. How many bad guys? Well, let's work on that a while. What happens when you beat a bad guy? Well, let's work on that a while. Yeah. But everything is based on every, the, the, the base of that pyramid is that core combat loop is really, really fun. And now we can build a game around that. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah, that's so good. So going back into it. So you, have, you start at the end, which you never do. <laughs> um, but... You know, yeah. I, I hear that and the people that I've interviewed before is always, always start at the end, but sometimes you have a great idea, which you just stick with. Um, I do have another quick question from somebody in the comments, uh, and the question is, what's the smallest scale you think in an alternate reality game is feasible? Could it be done to promote like a small local business? Yeah, it absolutely could. Look, the, the thing is, you just have to figure out what, how to make it how to make it so you don't lose money in building the thing, right? Yeah. Like if you could, if you do it for a small local business, which you absolutely can, theoretically, your audience is much smaller for that, right? Local business probably means you want them to physically walk in there, which means, okay, there's a subset of the population that's interesting to you. To reach that subset is much less expensive than to reach everyone in the country. Mm -hmm. So you can start approaching the problem that way. As long as you can make the math work, and I believe there's always a way to make the math work, um, you can you can find a way to not lose money on the thing. Ideally, you'd make some money as a service, uh, but if it's just promotion, like you're trying to promote your own store, uh, you can just do that cost analysis. Just figure out how many people you think you can draw in with this thing or how many you have to draw in in order to justify the cost associated with the thing and back solve it that way. But don't skip that step. It's so important. You do not want... The, the act of creating art that you enjoy uh, to sacrifice, you know, you don't want to sacrifice your ability to eat to yeah. build those things. Yeah, I'll, I do a lot of consultation, especially right now, with people that are proposing and doing things, and I always send a spreadsheet of the cost of things. Because I, 
what I do is kind of an alternate reality game. It's technically not like an ARG because usually it's a little bit more of like a treasure hunt, but treasure hunt is kind of an alternate reality same, game. Absolutely right? same. Yeah. Um, it's been weird because they've bucketed ARG into like it has to be this huge like digital and physical like behemoth that thousands yeah. of people work on. That's sort of sort of my fault. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I know. I think there's actually people like in the no proscenium world, the people that do a lot of that that are coming together to try to figure out the best way to name things. Like yeah. escape rooms aren't yeah. necessarily the best name, right. and like. Right. Scavenger Hunt doesn't quite work, but right. Parks and Rec took that, and they had the Scavenger Hunt episode, <laughs> and so now I do Scavenger Hunts, and it's like, come yeah. on! Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, and so I think it is possible, and it is funny, because I talk about it too, like, we're artists, and so we create these fun things, but it's like a math equation. You build it like a sexy, sexy yeah. math equation to make sure that the timing works and the money yep. works. And for what it's worth, I hate the name Alternate Reality Game. I think that's the worst, and, and it's... It's only the only thing I've ever heard worse than alternate reality game is transmedia storytelling. Whoa. Like just ugh, <laughs> so frustrating. <laughs> yeah, it's uh you know, but it makes sense. It it gets the idea, right? Alternate reality game. I can, I can I can hear the title of the name and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna assume it's some it's obviously it's a game. I'm gonna assume it maybe blurs the lines between this and this, but my my, my favorite quote about this uh, is I think it's from Winston Churchill. Uh, who said he was talking about democracy and he said democracy is the world's worst form of government except for all the other ones <laughs> alternate reality game is the worst title for these things except for all the other ones <laughs> that oh god that's amazing so um <laughs> can you just walk through the story of year zero um specifically the ending because i've told this story with other people that i've interviewed <laughs> talking about it and i remember you telling it to me over over lunch and it's just yeah. blowing my mind the thought that that put in because I like to think that I put a lot of thought into things, and I like to think that I've covered every angle, <laughs> and I have not because it's impossible. Um, so walk through year zero, and then sure. I have kind of a follow up question sure. for that. And so, like, so yeah, explain year zero first. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, year zero uh, was a year zero is the name of an album uh, from Nine Inch Nails. Uh, Trent Reznor, the lead singer for Nine Inch Nails, had this notion that he wanted to make. A concept album. He looked at like uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall and thought, like, man, there's a there's a story embedded in this, and it goes from track to track to track, and it's beautiful, and it's and it's evocative, and I want my next album to be that. And so he wrote a story. He wrote this really um, this this kind of terrifying, thought provoking story about a dystopian future where we've all kind of lost uh, our freedom of speech. Uh, uh, government was massively controlling. There were there were drugs in the water supply. Like it was a terrible, horrible place to be. And there were a lot of paths that you could easily trace between where we where we are now and how we might get there. And he told a story of a resistance that was uh, on an uprising uh, within those societies. And he and he told he he had each track on that album told a little bit of the story in a, a brilliant, brilliant way. That guy is so impressive. Oh. I might have gotten a little hiccup with the internet, and I will bring him back in when he comes in. I'm getting the beeping. Um, uh -oh. oh, there we right, go. Back. You are back right. in. Hey, sorry. Yep, you were talking about how sorry. impressive he is. Continue. Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so Trent Reznor is um, just such an impressive guy. And he, he came to us and he said, I have the story, or rather I have the soundtrack to this story. And what I need now is the actual movie. Like, how do I, how do I build that thing? And we, we sat down with him and started talking about it. We're like, well, what if we built a series of websites? And what if we hid things inside uh, the audio of your soundtrack? And what if we put things in your concerts and on your t-shirts? And what if we um, do this this thing that we called um, internet archaeology, which again, my mentor Jordan Weissman is a, a phrase that he coined. The basic idea is, if you think about an archaeologist, they uncover a pot from an ancient civilization, a vase. And it teaches them about that civilization. Here's what they drink, and here's how they moved, and here's the artwork, and the whole bit. But you don't find a vase. What you find are shards of a vase. And you slowly, meticulously uncover each one, and you put it back together until you've completed the puzzle. And that puzzle allows you to tell that story. That's the way that we told our stories. We would take this story of year zero, 
break it into a million different pieces and spread them out everywhere. Spread them in the album and in uh, uh, the concert and the t-shirts and, and all those things. And we would let the audience find them piece by piece without instruction, put them back together slowly. And the process of doing that collaboratively is what told the story of Year Zero. And it was a really beautiful way to tell stories. And I can talk for a long time about some of my favorite uh, puzzles and, and stories that we put in there. I'll, I'll just tell you one, which is to me the highlight, and then I'll jump to the end. Um, we took the disc, the actual CD for Year Zero, and it was just this elegant disc, all black, Year Zero written in small white text on the top, Nine Inch Nails written in small white text on the bottom. And you take that disc and you put it in your CD player and you hit play and you listen to the album. When you eject that disc, a different CD comes out of your CD player. The CD that comes out is all white. And there's a URL and a bunch of binary and other embedded puzzles all over the face of this thing. And it's the coolest magic trick because it happened right there in front of you. Um, and we did it using just a thermal ink, right? So we coated the whole disc with thermal ink so that the heat from your CD player when you played it would eat away at the ink. And then when you ejected it, a different CD comes out, right? The ink underneath it is now visible. And it would slowly grow back so you could do the trick over and over again. It was so much fun and blew everybody's mind because nobody knew it was coming. It just was this magic, magical thing that uh, you didn't know could possibly exist. So there's a bunch of stuff like that. Um, the question is uh, endings. How do you, like we kept upping the bar. We kept doing a cooler thing and a cooler thing and a thing in, in concerts and we did a thing with music videos and everything, you, you'd, you'd listen to audio in a different way and images would come out of wave files at like crazy bonkers stuff that I'm so proud of. But every time we did something like that, we kept raising the bar for ourselves. And so the question then became, well, how do you end something like this? How do we find a satisfying ending? And so what we ended up doing was uh, we had 50 of the most hardcore fans go through a series, jump through a series of hoops in order to get to a bus. It's eight o'clock at night, they all jump on this bus. All the windows are blacked out. We take away all their cell phones. Uh, we drive them around the block a bunch of times so they get all disoriented and, and they, they go up to, they arrive at a warehouse. The warehouse is actually only two blocks from where they started, but they don't know that. They've been driving for 45 minutes. Uh, so we take them to this warehouse and they go inside and inside uh, is Nine Inch Nails to do a private concert, 20, standing 20 feet away from Trent Reznor, all the energy in the world and they do this concert. And there's a bunch of story bits embedded all throughout this thing, but everyone's losing their mind because this is it. Like everyone who's doing this loves the story, but they're there because they're Nine Inch Nails fans and nobody gets an experience like this, like this close, intimate, personal setting. And, and there's the band doing what they do best. But how do you end that? So what we did was uh, to end it, about uh, however long through the 45 minutes into the show, a SWAT team comes bursting into the room, firing automatic weapons and throwing concussion grenades into the crowd. And everyone freaks out and they run towards the, the door opposite the SWAT team uh, where the bus is waiting. And they, and they jump on the bus and we're ready to go just like we wanted them to do, right? Perfectly choreographed, um, except for these three guys. <laughs> three guys sat there, like stood against the back wall with their arms crossed, just staring. And, and it's because they knew this is fake. What are you going to do? You're going to shoot it. Really? You want me to believe that's a real gun? Really? You want me to believe that those are real grenades? And they just stared kind of smirking. And so the SWAT team ran up to them, grabbed one of them, pushed him against the wall, punched him across the face and blood splatters all over the wall. And the guy crumbles onto the floor in a heap. And the other two turn white and their jaws hit the floor because suddenly this just got really real uh, and they run for the door just like they were supposed to do in the first place. And uh, it was a stuntman that we placed on the bus from the very beginning just in case uh, two idiots decided not to play along. Uh -huh. I'm really glad it worked because that was our plan B and we didn't have a plan C. So... Uh, Thank God for being lucky sometimes. Yeah, it's oh, that, that kind of stuff's amazing, and it, and it kind of goes in with how much thought. Because when you build some piece of this, and I, I guess when you're building an alternate game where you're just throwing in pieces, right? If one piece doesn't work, one piece of the story, you can always fit it in somewhere else, right? Like, yeah. just in case. Right. But right. there are those pinch points, like, at the end, where it's like, 
you know, you get there and the bus just doesn't work. And now you're like, oh, no, the bus doesn't yeah, work, right? Do do? Or right. an actor. <laughs> yeah. And so that's an interesting way because mine always end up being procedural. Very, like, you have to start here and then you go here and you go here. Uh, and so it is kind of nice to have that. But, oh, man, I just, I love that story. And I tell people that story all the time. And I'm glad I have, like, a good video of that because I'll cut that and put that other places, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I have one more question that just popped up um, about... Uh, alternate reality games, and then I want to pivot over to Exploding Kittens Company and Poetry for Neanderthals. So the oh, question, yeah, let's do it. yeah, question is: um, planning an alternate reality game, um, an ARG, takes a lot of planning. Do you have any particular ways to document it whilst planning, like notes, diagrams, etc.? Like how, yeah, how, how, how does that even begin? Do you put a big like spreadsheet, a mood board? Yeah, I feel like it would be easier today. Like today, I would use. Google for this. I would use a shared Google Doc where you could just paste in graphics and charts and sheets and, and everything. Um, when I built the last one that I worked on maybe about 10-ish years ago, something like that, uh, there was there were like no collaborative tools. So what we did, um, we actually had this overly complex naming convention where you would actually save file names based on not the hours and minutes but the seconds because we had to update things that quickly mm -hmm. so f file names would have the the time code embedded in them we would send them around to the team like frantically and crazily uh and then and that was the way we would always know what the latest what the latest file was just by comparing the titles uh down to the second yeah. um it was horrible and we made mistakes all the time and eventually what i did for most of my projects was i you just you have to pick a point person and you have to say like all the ideas floating around, nothing goes into play unless it goes through a single point that is the green light. And oftentimes that was me on projects. Sometimes it was other people uh, that I worked with, but uh, we, you just have to have it human controlled. It's, they are so much smarter than you are and they will work so much faster. And especially like all of this is easy in pre-planning, but once you launch and you realize that you have to update this thing in real time and you have to troubleshoot in real time and everything is on fire and everything is going wrong and you have to keep designing. You have to keep building the plane while it's in mid-flight. Uh, that point person becomes vital because uh, without it, it's, it's, it, you will always show them where the tears in the curtain are uh, and how sloppy things are unless there's one point of control. Oh. Were you usually that point of control? Or I, was was usually, I was usually that point of control um, in the case of the beast, I, I often, uh, switched points with my writing partner, Sean Stewart, who, uh, was, uh, just as involved as I was. Um, but the reason we had to switch back and forth was just sheer exhaustion. Um, we would work three to four day shifts without sleeping. And, uh, at that point you're just making horrible decisions. And so you have to pass the baton. Yeah. So really go back. So you talked about being a terrible student. Um, I always consider myself a pretty mediocre student because I mm -hmm. like, I just didn't want to do it, right? Where it's like, study for this test. And I'm like, oh, God, I'll just like study. Yeah. And, and then I, I, you know, I worked and I worked with kids, which is beyond, no, no surprise, the guy that builds treasure hunts works with kids. And then I worked for a tech company and I would go in and I would do fine. And it was great, but I didn't enjoy it. And now I finally found this business and I find myself working way more than I ever have before. Yeah. And is that the same thing with you where it's like, you know, you, you get out of like high school or college and you're like, ah, oh, this is great. I'm working at a grocery store. Because I, I had that feeling of like, I'm never going to be successful because I'm lazy, but I yeah. just had to find the thing that I loved. Yeah. Uh, I had a very similar thing. Um, finding the thing you love matters more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, for me in particular, what I found was I have to find, I have to put myself in a position where I'm rewarded for working on multiple things at a time. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out most of my problems in high school and college were because 45 minutes or an hour is way beyond my capacity to pay attention to a single thing. Um, we're on 36 I, minutes right now. So yeah, we'll yeah. But we're, but we're jumping all uh, yeah, over yeah. the place. Right. Um, it, and, and it's back and forth and that's really important and it's engaging. Like sitting in a lecture, I'm gone 17, 17 minutes in. I, I think, I think I found, uh, I actually have an hourglass in, in my office back when we had offices. That's exactly 27 minutes long. Because 27 minutes is what I've found today to be the absolute upper limit of my attention span. And if I work on something beyond 27 minutes, 
everything after that mark is horrible. Even if it doesn't seem horrible at the time, it's horrible. And if I go back the next day, I will acknowledge, oh my God, sure enough, 27 minute mark, horrible, horrible, horrible. And uh, the ability to jump around, it's not that like I need a nap or anything, it's that I have to, I have to flex a different muscle. I have to go work on a different project, think about a different thing, talk to a different person, go for a walk around the block, whatever it is, uh, I'm, I'm done. And I have to acknowledge that I'm done. And school did not accommodate that at all. No. Yeah, school is uh, whatever. Um, I think was it Einstein that said if you, you know, if you judge a all like a monkey and a fish on how well they climb a tree, like the fish will go its entire life thinking it's a failure. And so that is the tricky thing with school is they're trying to fit all these people into this box. Yeah. And it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, exactly right. It's so, a hard problem. I'm glad I do not have to solve that problem because uh, man, that's a tough one. I know. Yeah. Oh well. Um, so you were doing this. Uh, and then I know that you had started uh, kind of a second company where taking funding, and that's when Exploding Kittens happened. Yeah. Um, I, uh, let's see. So I was, well, I was working on a whole bunch of startups. I, I, did, I did a series of startups. Uh, I did 42 Entertainment, and then uh, I did a clothing company, and then I did uh, a clothing company, by the way, embedding puzzles in T-shirts was super fun and interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I did uh, a television studio that was really fun, and I won an Emmy. And I thought, like, I'm gonna go be a TV producer. Um, and then uh, I went back to work at Microsoft because Microsoft wanted a television studio, mm -hmm. and so uh, I took a job there trying to build an interactive TV model for them. Uh, then, then I realized I really. I'm not good at having a boss. I, I'm just, it, it's not, it's not what I excel at. I really like working on my own stuff and I really like jumping around as I said. And so I started, uh, yeah, raising funds for a new company, uh, to build an interactive TV platform that places like Microsoft and Amazon could all use. Um, because it was, uh, I'll tell you about it someday, a very, a very clever system that someday I, I do hope to build. Okay. Um, but in that time, uh, I also thought it is really important that for at least a while, I stop building things that put people in front of screens. I've been doing that for 20 years. Every time, every time anyone looks at my work, they're not paying attention to the people in the room. They're not interacting. They're not, they're, they're playing video games, right? And it's not, I don't feel good about that anymore. So I thought I would take a year off and work on a card game. Cause I thought, what, it, what you know, people sitting around a table, experiencing joy, celebrating each other, talking, putting their phones down. I want to be responsible for that. And I thought, uh, let me let me work on a card game. I teamed up with two friends, uh, Shane Small and Matt Inman, who writes and draws, who writes and created the Oatmeal. Oh yeah. And uh, we came up with this cute card game that we all kind of fell in love with. Uh, and then we put it up on Kickstarter. <laughs> And yeah, my idea for taking a year off went all the way down to just two weeks off before uh, I had to take that very, very seriously and start a company around it. Yeah, I, um, I just interviewed a, a woman named Rita Orlov, who's a friend of mine in New York, who has a puzzle tale uh, called uh, um, Emerald Flame. She did Tale of Ord, which is essentially like a mail-in puzzle that takes you, you know, anywhere between, I think, 8 to 15 hours to build. And wow. she had the same thing with Kickstarter, where she put it on Kickstarter... And I'm familiar with Kickstarter, and I've supported things, but I've never been kind of on the inside until her Kickstarter, you know, hit its goal in the first, like, four hours. <laughs> and it's such an exciting thing to see somebody who just built something so amazing and have it be so successful. Yeah. Uh, so Exploding Kittens is by far the most backed Kickstarter project of all time. I looked it up. It was, like, 220000 where yeah. second place is, like, just over 100000 and it's, like, yeah. bring Reading Rainbow back, which I'm all yeah. about, too. Yeah, yeah, um, right. I think I saw an interview. We said it was it hit the $10,000 goal in, like, four minutes or seven minutes or something seven like that. Seven minutes, yeah. What was yeah. your day like when that happened? Like, did, did you have any idea? Like, did you... It was, it was so... What a weird day that was. I, um, I had no idea. I had no idea. I remember um, before before you start a Kickstarter campaign, you have to link your Kickstarter campaign to a bank account because they want to be able to do financial transactions and they, they don't want to save that for later. They want to make sure that you either uh, can pay things, pay fees that you need to and can accept the funds as they come in, et cetera. 
So I, uh, I linked it to a bank account. I, I went to my local bank branch and I walked in and I said, I need to open a bank account, a company bank account uh, for this thing. And she looked at all the papers that I'd filled out and she said, okay, uh, this all seems fine. Yeah, this is really easy, but we have to, we have to set an alarm. We have a, an alert system where if too much gets withdrawn or too much gets deposited, you're going to get a text notification because there's probably fraud involved. And so she said, what do you want that amount to be? And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, don't you have a preset thing? And she's like, no, it's whatever you want it to be. What amount of money gets moved into your account that you need a text alert because potentially something has gone wrong? And I was <laughs> like, well, we're trying to raise $10,000, so why don't we set it at $20,000? And she's like, oh, come on, stretch, come on. Like, like what in your, in your wildest dreams, what might you make on this? And I was like, all right, fine. Set the alert at $100,000. And she's like, oh, okay, fine. So she said it. I went home. We launched the Kickstarter thing. And I think 23 minutes into it, I get a call from her, not a text message, a call from her screaming, like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was the day I realized uh, this is, <laughs> you know that scene in Jaws where the guy comes, they're on the boat and the guy comes in. He's like, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah. Like, that was that was that day, that entire day for me is how, how are we going to do like we're yeah. not equipped for this. What do we do? Oh, uh, it's such a good problem to have, though. I, I my my roommate uh, helped me start my business and I consider him just like my guru when it comes to business because he's launched successful like local small businesses. And he talks about it's always like there are good prob There are bad problems and there are good problems. And your good problem of like, how am I going to handle this much success is so much better than like, how do I get success? And so that's so funny. And it's always, it's always great to hear that. Do you think, how much of it was, do you think would be attributed to Matthew Inman's oatmeal? Because I am very familiar with the yeah. oatmeal and I followed it. So, so there's, there's two answers. The, the easy answer to that is 100%. Yeah. Like Matt, Matt has earned... Uh, an incredible following. He oh, is funny hilarious. and smart and, and people want to consume everything he puts out. So when Matt posts to the internet and to his following, I have a new card game. Here's some sample cards. Please check it out. Millions of people come in the door. Yep. No, no doubt about it. And I underestimated that by a lot. Matt's audience carried us through the first week. Yep. Uh, and, and it was literally millions of views, 100% because of the oatmeal traffic. After that, something else happened. After that, we saw the numbers um, start to dip precipitously. Like we, we went to, you know, from a few hundred thousand views per minute to a few thousand to a few hundred to like a dozen. And uh, we realized, okay, so we've exhausted, everyone who's gonna buy the game has now bought the game. Cool, we're a huge success. We've made $2 million. That's insane. We're That's trying to raise $10,000. We made $2 million. This is incredible. Matt, you're amazing. Off we go. Yeah. And then we started talking about it. We're like, well, but but we do have three weeks left. <laughs> <laughs> and and are there things we can do? Do we do we really just give up? Like what 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 should we what discussion should we be having here? And the realization that I came to was I've been training for this moment my whole life. <laughs> I am really good at convincing a huge group of people to behave in a very particular way. And what if we started to employ some of those skills? And so we, um, we took down our Kickstarter page and we changed, we changed it in a way that I don't think had ever been done on Kickstarter before. I cannot verify this, but I at least had never seen it. Um, the, the way a typical Kickstarter campaign works is you set up a series of stretch goals, right? We were trying to raise $10,000, but if we get $20,000, we will for free upgrade the carrying case. We will give you all a free t-shirt. We'll throw in some posters, etc. We did all the same things. We're like, we'll upgrade the carrying case and add more cards and blah, blah, blah. But we are going to make the conscious decision not to tie it to money. We made $10,000. We don't care if we make 20000 We actually made $2 million. We don't care if we make $3 million. We don't care about money at all anymore. That's no longer part of the discussion. Instead, all of our stretch goals are going to be tied to what we're going to call achievements. <laughs> the achievements are free. The achievements are silly and fun and ridiculous and awesome. Like one of the characters in our game is called Taco Cat. 
right? He's a palindrome. Spell taco cat backwards, still spells taco cat. How awesome is that? Show us a picture of a real taco cat. And if you can show us 20 pictures of a real taco cat, automatic instant upgrade to everybody's game. Uh, how about a picture of 10 Batmans in a hot tub? <laughs> the hell does that mean? Try it. Go, go figure it out. 100 people wearing cat ears. Write us a limerick. Write us a haiku. We just made these fun, silly challenges that you could do for free, but most of them would involve including your friends to share this insane fun joy with them. And we saw our numbers, like our curve started big and then went down and then jumped right back up and stayed there wow. for the rest of the three weeks. And that's how we jumped from 2 million to almost 9 million uh, by the end of the campaign. We just gamified the system and we encouraged people. Uh, the, your, your gameplay loop, the thing we talked about earlier, is come to this party with us. Every day, come back to this party. We're going to provide the entertainment at the party, but every day, come back. And you know what? Bring your friends. That's even more fun. And we just did that every single day until the end of it and ended up breaking a whole bunch of records. Oh, that's that's so cool. And it's such just a creative way. And it's so fast because Kickstarter is not old. And it definitely wasn't old when this came out. Was it 2015? 2014? Uh, 2015. Yeah. 15, yeah. I don't know how old it is, but, it, it, you know, you basically, Alternate Reality Game was creating a new form of, I guess, marketing, but form of, like, yeah. fun. And this yeah. was basically taking that Kickstarter and making something. I remember seeing that looking like, Five Spider Man in a kayak, like how does that work? You know, like how does that goal work? But then you also think about like if I'm if I'm putting this whole thing together, I probably reached out to twenty people to find five that are gonna put on a Spider Man costume with me. Right. As I buy these costumes or rent them, I'm telling people, then it's definitely going on Snapchat or Instagram or Reddit or one of those, and like now everyone's like, Why are you doing that? And you're like, exploding kittens, and then they go on and yep. it just that's that was exactly the premise. That was that was what we designed it to do. And uh Man, it was so fun to see that thing work. Yeah. Like that was the first thing I've ever worked on, where uh, in a normal alternate reality game, I can watch the audience numbers, I can watch views on a website, I can see how many times a phone number was called, and that's great. I love watching those numbers go up. This was the first time there was actually people spending money uh, on a thing, right? Yeah. All alternate reality game in my history has always been free. Yeah. This was the first time there was a charge, but it's not like I'm charging you to play. It's you like this game enough that you're going to buy this other product that yeah. is associated with it. Yeah. And that felt amazing because everybody wins in that scenario. That's incredible. Um, so you were planning on doing Burning Cat, right? Oh, Which is yeah. basically oh, the Burning Man. I know that was supposed to be in May in Portland, yeah. where I live. In, in Portland, I know. Are you, are, is that like, understandably, events can't happen until there's a vaccine, and that's like maybe a year from now. I'm assuming that had to be completely shuttled, or is it just table? Like, are you going to plan on doing that? Yeah, it's tabled. We have a warehouse. Like, one of the things we built for Burning Cat is a 60 foot tall animatronic fire-breathing cat like it's amazing <laughs> it's so cool and his eyes light up and there's lasers and uh and and we built this thing and and it i think we even posted a video of it like he he is built she is built she is working she's glorious um but she's gonna sit in a warehouse for a while and we don't even know if we can do this thing in 2021 yet because most convention centers portland included yeah. they're not even selling dates yeah. because they don't they it's don't totally. know what the future looks like and so we're going to have to sit on it for a while, which is heartbreaking. Um, but I am fairly convinced that someday we will do conventions again. And on that day, we will announce new Burning Cat dates. Have you thought about doing um, an alternate reality game or something to or have that go on? And if so, there is a great event planner in Portland. Uh, uh, this this uh, thing is all a ruse just for you to hire me to do to, some behind the talk. scenes thing. Yeah. I know. Yeah, right? let's talk. We can bring in like people like Tommy Haunton and other like that. Oh, that'd be so much fun. Um, yeah, that's my shameless plug. You need somebody in Portland to build something. But have you thought about doing some type of event like to? We we have um, we have quite a bit actually. We um, the the reason that we came up with Burning Cat is because we kept getting kicked out of conventions, and the reason we kept getting kicked out of conventions is for a very alternate reality thing that we kept doing at conventions which I will tell you about. Oh boy. Uh, we, um, the problem that I had with conventions was they're, they're required. If you start a games company, you have to go to these things. Yeah. They're, but they're so boring. Oh, yeah. uh, it's noisy and crowded and everyone's fighting for the same audience. And even when somebody comes up to your booth, 
they give you money, they buy the game, they walk away. They have no memory of that transaction. They have no memory of you. It's such a letdown. And, and someone will have 45 of those experiences in a day and not remember any of them. Mm. And so I thought, okay, we got to do better than that. If we got to go to these things, we have to do better than that. And let's start by analyzing what, what is that interaction? That interaction is no better than a vending machine, right? Walk up, put money in, push a button, get a thing, walk away. Yeah. All right, so let's start there. Let's build the world's coolest vending machine. And so we built an eight foot tall, fur covered vending machine. And it's, it's the, you just, you see this thing, you just want to walk up and hug it. It's so pretty and inviting and it's got the big googly eyes. I just, it's great, but it is just a vending machine. Put in money, push button, get game. Yeah. So we put an extra button on it. And the extra button says random item, $1. That's all it says. Oh, who doesn't so love the you, mystery box? Right. So now you put in a dollar and you push the button. And what comes out is truly random. Push it. You might get a toilet plunger or a pineapple or an origami, a piece of or an origami animal. Or you might get a jump rope or you might get a parachute, a little action figure. Like there are, we built this thing in such a way that it can accommodate more than 2,000 items uh, in the random item slot. Wow. And what happened is people lost their minds. They, the wait for this thing, just to go up and push some buttons, got to about two hours long at a, at a typical conference. The line got so long that it would wind away from our booth, blocking everybody else's booth, blocking the fire lanes out the hall, down the street, outside the convention center. And uh, of course, the fire marshal would eventually shut us down because we, we have no ability to control a crowd like that. And uh, it's a big hazard for them. So the gimmick, the trick, sorry, the, this is all the magic trick. It's all fake. The yeah. way we actually did it, it's not a vending machine. It's a vending machine costume. There are eight people inside running around like lunatics, building these random items for people as they walk up. Mm -hmm. And everything is custom to the person who walks up to it. So uh, uh, Danny Targaryen, right, the mother of dragons from Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. we see her waiting in line. We spend half an hour <laughs> dazzling a watermelon so that when she walks up, we can give her a dragon egg. And when we do that, not only does she go insane, but the audience goes insane. Yeah. And we get these crowds that 200 people start building bleachers so they can sit in front of our booth and just watch the performance. Yeah. Oh, that, that was amazing. Oh, we're having another little internet hiccup, but we will... So once he comes back in, we're actually going to play uh, Poetry for Neanderthals. Um, oh, looks like he might have come back in. Okay, back. Oh, he's back in. Hey, sorry about that. So I figured I'd give you a quick second. Yeah, that's the yeah. internet, you know. Um, quick second just to talk. That That's incredible, and I would imagine that's the case. And so that is the reason why Burning that's Cat. That's why we started Burning Cat. We thought, all right, enough of getting kicked out. Let's let's just rent out the Portland Convention Center and do our own convention and invite our favorite people and play games with them. So that, that is, was burning. Well, I hope it happens, and I will be there regardless of if I'm involved because I live in Portland. It's way too easy. Um, so <laughs> let's take the... We only have a few minutes left. I don't know if we can go a little bit over. Um, sure. But I want to talk about Poetry for Neanderthals. Um, you yeah. told me about... When I reached out to see if you could do this interview, you told me about this. I grabbed potentially the last one in Portland. I went to three targets and I looked <laughs> online and they're like, I know it's so hard to find because obviously the supply chain is just completely messed up. So talk a little bit about it. And then I have some cards all set and I have the no stick and I have a yeah. lovely person who is going to come grab the no stick and hit me over the head with it. So do you want to talk it. about how it came to be? And do you want to yeah. talk about the rules? Yeah. So, um, I was raised um, playing a bunch of board games, but my favorite one, my favorite word game was Taboo. And if you've never played Taboo, uh, it's like a 30 year old game, but I would play it with my brothers all the time. And it's really simple, right? It's here's, here's a card, there's a word on the card. It says gazebo. And underneath it, there are five other words. And these are the five words you cannot say. You can't say house or wicker or backyard or whatever, right? And, and you can say anything else. There's no other rules. Say anything you want. Get get them to say gazebo, but you can't use these five words. We love that game. We used to play it all the time. There's a little uh, uh, hourglass that you set up, and how many of these cards can you get through in two minutes? So many game companies over the years have tried to come up with something as good as Taboo, because it's very simple to manufacture, but it's really hard to find that core gameplay mechanic that is as fun as Taboo. And I've been searching for one forever, and I, I've been completely unsuccessful. Until... 
uh, some friends came to me and they said, we have this really fun concept. We've written a bunch of nonsensical sentences down. Uh, the dragon goes to the grocery store to buy an eggplant and a zucchini. Can you say, can you get us to say that sentence using only single syllable words? And so I tried and it was hilarious, right? It's so hard to do complex sentences like that using single syllable words, so hard to do. And I wasn't very good at it, but it was hilarious because what I realized is I started to sound like a caveman as I was speaking. And uh, I, I asked them if we could keep playing around with it, keep developing that concept. And eventually we took it, we simplified it all the way down to taboo, deck of cards, single word on each card. All you're trying to do is get your teammates to say that word on the card. The rule is you can only use words with one syllable. And what happens as a result is you will sound like a caveman. You have no choice and you will sound ridiculous and everybody laughs. And what I love most about this game is whenever we test out games, we have a bunch of families that help us test games and we send them the prototypes and we say, hey, can you videotape yourself playing? And then send us the videotape and then send us the game back. Uh, everyone sent the videotapes back. Not a single family sent the prototype back. <laughs> And they refuse to. When we ask for them, they're like, no, just Lots. no. <laughs> and uh, what an incredible, flattering way to tell us this thing is really fun and you, you might have something here. So we just launched it called Poetry for Neanderthals. The, the giant no stick is the yes. caveman club, Here's... the inflatable club. Uh, and when somebody uses more than one symbol, you get to bop them on the head, yeah. uh, which we think is just delightful. All right. So I have my wonderful assistant here who's going to grab the snow <laughs> stick. Um, I have, oh, there it goes. I have uh, a couple cards. Um, cool. So the basic premise is obviously getting somebody to guess the, the, the word. There is essentially two versions, like a one point and a three point. So I actually have, I picked out some, some words prior that I didn't think about at all. I just picked them up so that'd be good. Great. And so we're going to go through the one point ones, which I'm going to put on the screen right now. You can't okay. see, but right. anybody else watching can. Great. I'm going to put a one minute timer just for yeah. sake of yeah. that. Now, wait, let me, let me just say, because I get accused of this all the time. Mm -hmm. I have not memorized these words. There mm -hmm. are so many cards in this game and there's two on each side, uh, mm -hmm. two on each side, and there's two sides to each card. There are so many words. I promise you, I cannot cheat at this game. I do not know what words you have. Okay, so let's get my, my no stick assistant, who I have instructed any time I use a two syllable word, um, she will hit me with this no stick. Okay, um, can I give you one one thing? Sorry, I don't mean to keep cutting you off, but this is super important. I'm yes. gonna give you a pro, a pro tip. Okay. Okay, here's my pro tip. Yes. Ah. <laughs> no, wait, uh, uh, not yet. Perfect. <laughs> um, speak in full sentences. Yes. As much as you possibly can. What what a lot of players try to do their first time, and we have to talk them out of, is like, let's say, uh, we just made a video about this. Let's say the word was brick. Yeah. First time players will will stare at that card and say, red, cube. Yeah. Uh, hard. <laughs> and 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 nobody's gonna. No, you don't know what to do with that. I don't know how to react to that. But if you say. This red thing make use to build house by pig to keep wolf out. Yeah, right? like that makes if sense. If you do that, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna get to brick. Okay. So, full so sentences. I got a chat basically said we want to do chat versus Elon. So I'll we'll go through this one time and I won't put the right. words up for the next time and then we okay. can try to do that. Right. Oh, let's do it. Right. I love it. So for now, you guys can see me as I struggle through these words with a one minute timer, uh, and we'll go through. I won't do the three point ones, just the one point ones. All right, are you ready? No stick. You ready? Okay, they're ready. Okay. <laughs> this thing used to play drum set. Stick. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. This place you go to fly in uh, plane. Airport. Yeah. Uh, airport terminal. Yes, airport. Yeah, okay. This thing smell nice in oh. outside. No. Flower. Oh, oh, <laughs> <that was fun. laughs> um, this spin round on car. In uh, tire wheel. Uh, yes, wheel. Uh, this fruit, real sour. Sour lemon. Lemon. Sa yes, uh, lemon. Yes. Lemon. Is yeah, sour right. one syllable? Okay, last one. Oh, we can talk about those for a while. You find this on beach. Sand, ocean, water, uh, tide, waves. Very. Oh, very. <laughs> 
Uh, I almost made it with a couple hit stick things. Nice. Uh, yeah, I Nicely done. It was well shell. Done. Perfect. Thank you. I, shell. Yes, yeah. it was shell. I know. I was, I was trying to say pretty, and yeah. it just it, it didn't go. So yeah. what will do I now? Was, mm-hmm. I, I was playing with a friend, and he said this brilliant thing. What was it? He said uh, he, he was trying to get me to say celery, mm-hmm. and uh, he, he had manipulated the words to get me – sorry – he was trying to get me to say carrot, mm-hmm. and he manipulated the words to make me say out loud orange celery. And mm-hmm. I sat there, orange celery. What's an orange celery? Oh my god! And he just <laughs> kept like pointing at me. I was like, oh, a carrot. Yeah, and it was glorious. Such yeah. a such a fun. Thing. It's such a great twist on like your standard like you guess the word game, you know? Because yeah. we've uh, and yes, here actually, can I see the no stick really quickly? Um, it is an inflatable stick. It comes with the game. It is called the no stick. And the idea is if you're playing with multiple people, you know, one person is trying to get the rest of the crew to guess, and then another person's job is to sit there and, like, hit them over the head with it whenever they, they mess it up. It is amazing. Yep. So yep. we're going to do one more round. I know we're a little bit over time. I hope that's okay. Um, sure. We're going to go for the three point. Now, normally in the game, I give you the word to figure out the one point, and if I want to go for the gusto, I can go for a three point. So in the case of, like, um, lemon... The, the first word is lemon, and the second word is lemon slice. So once you get lemon, you can get lemon slice. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to see uh, chat getting here. I hope most of the chat's up to date. I guess anybody that comes in can watch over the front, but we will see. All right, um, all right I'm going to put the timer on one minute again for no other reason than I think it's fun to have a timer. Yep. Uh, my no stick is ready. Are you ready? Okay, no stick is ready. And we are doing it right these things use with card game. Uh, uh, chips? Poker chips? Yes, poker uh, chips. Yeah. This person... Oh, shit! Person! <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm going to keep up. This... Oh, shoot. I'm just going to skip it. Um, okay. I get hit with this in game. Stick? No stick? Uh, uh, club? Yes, um, yes. Uh, club? I okay. eat... This. Uh, club food. Food, food club? Uh, uh, bread and bread and... Sandwich. Club sandwich. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Got it. Sport. Um, so Baseball, fun. basketball, uh, football, hockey. Hot sport. Volleyball. Uh, four year. Sport. Four years. Olympics. Olymp- Summer Olympics. Yes. I, shoot, I, I lost this. Hold on. We lost time. I can do the last one just because I can. Um, no, wait till I'm playing. Stop. Don't hit me with this thing again. Um, I hurt thumb with a slice uh, with knife. this. A uh, knife, small a knife. print this out. Uh, uh, um, uh, I, I uh, type. Cut, blade, laser, uh, blade? Nope. Uh, previous. Cut. Yes. <laughs> Once I say a word, you can say it. Oh, perfect. Cut. Uh, okay. Uh, with a thin white... Oh, paper cut. Yes! Uh, I guess... But, oh. <laughs> All right. So, there we go. <laughs> nice job. Thank that you. was awesome. You are good. Okay, I will take this away from yeah. you now. <laughs> uh, yeah, me and my roommates have been playing this, and it is just so much fun. Oh, Thank you, good. chat, for getting in there. <laughs> they got involved. <laughs> Though I think some of them are on a delay because they're all yelling paper cut right now. Right. Um, <laughs> which is good. So I will wrap it up. Thank you for letting this go a little bit longer. My pleasure. Um, before we head out, what, what, where can people find you? What should people do, obviously, besides purchase poetry? Yeah, the uh, the, I'm, I'm findable on social media, just Elon Lee. Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff, just Elon Lee. Uh, and explodingkittens.com is the easiest way to find all the new stuff that I'm making every day. Perfect. Uh, and then, uh, the last thing, is there any chance you could ever get back into like the event game, the alternate reality game, or are you kind of scratching that itch with exploding kittens a little bit? Yeah. I think that's the key for me is to figure out how to apply it to exploding kittens, Mm -hmm. which I'm very excited about. Oh, well, that is, I'm so excited to see what you guys do next. I love the games that you guys have and play. And thank you so much for it's taking some time. And, um, yeah, chat, thank you guys so much for playing along. Uh, and until next week, uh, I'll see you guys later. Thanks, everyone.